joining us. Um, my name is Kara Kuykendall. I'm the head of adult services here. Thrilled to have you be a part of today's uh, program. If you are a frequent attendee of our programs, looking at Utah, you might recognize today's speaker. Um, Dr. Simonson has spoken here at the library several times, and it's, it's always a treat. Um, typically, Kai Swanson from Augustana College is here, but he was unable to make it today, so I have the words that he wrote for you today. <coughs> our speaker today joined, a, joined both Augustana College's history department and its Women's, Gender, and Sexuality Studies program in 2006. Her route to Rock Island from her hometown of Eau Claire, Wisconsin, included stops at Gustavus Adolphus College, so that right, <laughs> in Minnesota, and the University of Iowa, where she earned a PhD in American Studies. Her research interests include women and work in the US, Native American assimilation, material culture, and the American West. Her book, Making Home Work, Domesticity and Native American Assimilation in the American West, 1860 to 1920, traces relationships between white women reformers and Native American women that occurred as part of government-sanctioned attempts to assimilate Native Americans. <clears throat> for her work as a scholar and for being an outstanding teacher, <laughs> she was recently named the Richard A. Swanson Chair in Social Thought at Augustana College. Friends, please join me in welcoming Dr. Jane Simonson. Thank you, uh, Kara, for that intro, and thanks, Kai, for that intro. <laughs> You're out there, I know it. Um, I really appreciate it um, being here today, and I also want to note that um, so Kathy Webb, who is also in Women, Gender, and Sexuality Studies at Augustana, is here today, and our longtime uh, program director, Vicki Summer, is here today, too, so it's great to see you mm -hmm. back um, and talking about feminism with you. So as you can probably hear from my background, I'm not uh, an expert in Barbie, though I did play with Barbie quite frequently um, as a child. Um, and so as I was kind of thinking about what, you know, what to talk about for, for this lecture, Kai had asked me if I would um, present some of the history of feminism that may or may not be present in the film, and we can think about that a little bit, um, and, and about this idea of feminist waves. And so I tried to come up with something catchy and fun, you know, what can Barbie see from her, her beach house? Um, but I also want to talk about this idea of reconsidering the idea of waves of feminism. Um, that's a, a term that's been around for a long time, um, and some folks say it maybe has um, more limited use than it used to have, and so that's something we'll talk about um, here today as well. So when I kind of started thinking about this, <laughs> you know, what, what, what wave does the Barbie movie belong to if we, if we think about the waves of feminism? And so I started with someone who critiqued the film, uh, <laughs> kind of famously or infamously on uh, kind of a, a, a long rant about the Barbie movie, um, Ben Shapiro, who said, either you're a third wave feminist who hates men, truly hates men, or you're brainwashed. Um, and I thought about that, and I thought, well, <coughs> there might be many ways in which I think this critique is misguided, but I thought, well, then Shapiro doesn't really know what a third wave feminist is, uh, does he? <laughs> because if there's one thing, one, one of the characteristics of, of third wave feminists is, is that they did want to kind of reclaim uh, relationship and intimacy with men in some ways, although we can talk about how, how, how truthful that idea of reclaiming really is. Um, and I'm, so I'm not quite sure that there's, that this is a third wave film at all, because we may now be in another wave entirely. Um, so it's sort of food, food for thought from a critic of the film. So a couple things we'll talk about today. So what, what are the waves of feminism as we generally understand them? Um, what views of feminism are enabled by this wave metaphor? How does it help us to think about what feminism is? What aspects of feminism might be obscured by this metaphor? What can we not see when we think about feminism as being a series of waves? And then are there other ways of seeing feminist history than this idea of waves metaphor um, and, and what that might mean for us? So I'll try, I'm trying to get a little creative there in thinking about that. 
So as I said to Leslie Dupree, there's a, there's a moment for audience participation here. Um, what are the waves of feminism? Do people know? You heard, people heard this term before, probably, maybe. Some nods. Leslie? Uh, well, <laughs> the suffragists were the first wave. And then in the 60s, late 50s and 60s, the, you have Betty Friedan and her group. And then the third wave, I guess, would be now. Yeah. People like me. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> we have a feminist in the audience. <laughs> Leslie does have a great background in feminist activism. So, yeah, I mean, commonly understood that the first wave of feminism is um, the fight for suffrage, right? Uh, that was sort of organized as we see it around the campaign um, for voting rights for women. If we think about it this way, we often start at, in 1848 at the Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention and end in 1920 with the passage of the 19th Amendment. Um, if you notice on my timeline, there's a lot of space between 1848 and 1920. Um, and I can guarantee you that all of this time was not spent on talking about suffrage or voting rights for women. Um, and we can talk about this more later, but even some of the, the, the original Seneca Falls Women's Rights Convention was contested, right? Not everyone agreed with what the feminist, or at that time, um, women's rights agenda would be. And there were a lot of people at that convention, some of whom were men, some of whom were African American, most famously Frederick Douglass was there, um, were not interested in voting rights for women. There were other things they were interested in education, um, divorce, uh, wages for women, property rights. So it, it wasn't all a continuous line in, in, in moving forward towards um, the 19th Amendment in 1920. The second wave, right? Often people start this with Betty for Dance, The Feminine Mystique, which I think is one of the books on the table over there, um, passed in 1963. That was the year my parents got married. <laughs> I think that's funny um, <laughs> because it's about uh, college-educated white middle-class women being um, unhappy with being housewives. Um, so kind of a li limited group of people she was talking about, but my mother was in that group. Um, and oftentimes people kind of end it with um, the, the end of the campaign for ERA, um, or what people see as the end of the campaign for ERA, which has not ended um, because it hasn't passed. Mm -hmm. uh, this is something I often have to remind my students of. They think that there is an equal rights amendment that says you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of gender. Um, I think they've become more aware of that in the last couple of years, that there is no such amendment. But again, I mean, less time here, 20 years, but still a lot going on in those 20 years. And some of you probably lived through those 20 years. The third wave um, has a kind of amorphous beginning, depending on what you want to start it from. Um, so some begin it in usually around 91, 92, Rebecca Walker, um, who wrote an essay called Becoming the Third Wave. Uh, some people started with Judith Butler, a kind of a feminist philosopher who talked about gender as a performance of, of kind, so that the way you are a gendered being is the way that it is performed by you. And then the Anita Hill, um, Clarence Thomas, uh, hearing, which there's a couple books about that as well. And all of those ended up kind of being catalysts for thinking about um, what many people, uh, including maybe Ben Shapiro, see as kind of a multicultural feminism, where people say there's more voices participating in this, um, more ideas about um, choice and freedom going on during this time period, um, more focus on uh, sexuality and sexual expression amongst, uh, amongst feminists. So a little more amorphous in some ways, and some people aren't sure ha has that wave ended or not. Um, because that's the wave that I kind of was part of, you know, as somebody who went to college in the 90s. I'm still here, right? <laughs> so <laughs> some people might say, well, those feminists are still around, but we also have this other wave coming along afterwards too. So multicultural feminism may be still in effect, but maybe in a, a different kind of form. Some folks say we're in a fourth wave. Um, and again, there's some difference in interpretation about what that fourth wave might be. Some call it post-feminism. Um, in one form, that kind of means why do we even need feminism anymore um, if women are 
CEOs of companies and things like that. Do we need feminism, some would say? Um, so other ways of interpreting, interpreting what post-feminism might mean is this idea of um, kind of focusing on individual choice, uh, women's choices, uh, freedom. There's a lot of um, critique of media culture that's associated with post-feminism. How are women um, represented in the media, in TV, film? So Barbie kind of falls into that category. Some of the discussion of Barbie in general might fall into this idea of post-feminist um, critique of women's representation. Some though might call this phase neoliberal feminism, and I don't know if that's a term that a lot of people are familiar with, but it's one that we talk about sometimes in, in higher education, um, which is this idea that, um, that kind of the individual and your own ability to kind of make your own choices in the world, earn your own money in the world, um, is kind of the basis for your feminism. So I, I kind of put on there the, in, in about 2012, 2013, the kind of Sheryl Sandberg, Marie, oh, I, I made a mistake, Anne Slaughter, sorry, <laughs> debate. Um, Anne Slaughter's book is over there. But these were both questions about like women's role in the workforce. So Sheryl Sandberg, uh, who wrote Lean In, who kind of said, hey women, if you want to have power in the marketplace, in the workforce, lean in. Right? Let's, let's do what the men are doing. Let's make the changes that we need to make um, to, to be part of this workforce. Um, Slaughter kind of said that's really hard to do. Uh, women need to learn how to negotiate work-life balance. What's kind of characteristic about both those viewpoints, and some would say of neoliberalism, neoliberal feminism in general, is that it's about individual women trying to figure out how to make it in a world that hasn't really changed that much. Right, so when we talk about things like work-life balance now, like how do I handle you know, being at work and then going home and taking care of my kids if needed, um, it, that, that's on me, right? I need to figure out how to make that work for myself. So some would say that, that neoliberal feminism has really kind of shifted the focus in some ways to the individual and how that person is able to make things work for themselves so that they can succeed. Um, and even this idea that, um, Power is a zero-sum game, right? Which causes some of the conflict, um, even over movies like Barbie, where Ben Shapiro is kind of upset, <laughs> and, and even or, or the idea that you can either have Barbie Land or one where Ken rules, and there's nothing in between. Um, so that it's it's difficult to imagine how somebody else's life can get better without mine getting worse, and that's not a super productive way to think about um, achieving justice. So um, for, for what it's worth, there's kind of different ways of thinking about this kind of wave that we might be in right now. And I might say even in the last couple of years, maybe one characteristic of the fourth wave um, for young folks is this idea of kind of resilience, like making it through, um, focusing on mental health in times of crisis. So I think that's kind of an interesting characteristic of, of fourth wave, possibly fourth wave feminism. But I promise we kind of talk about like, wh what does it mean if we talk about feminism as a series of waves? And here I'm drawing um, on a book that was published about 10 years ago by Nancy Hewitt. Uh, she's the editor, so this is a collection of essays by different writers. It's called Cleverly No Permanent Waves. Yeah. So if you look at the picture, you can see different waves, if you'll notice. There's you know, water, there's the wave, there's the hair wave, um, and there's radio waves, which is kind of important to her argument. Um, but she kind of argues that when we use this metaphor of waves, it gives us a kind of impression of feminism as something that kind of surges forward, kind of relentless. You know, it, it does have some ebbs, but it's kind of moving forward. Um, it's powerful. It's breaking barriers. It might be kind of a rising tide, right, where everyone's lifted up together. Um, some ebbs and flows, so like on the timeline that I showed you, it suggests that there's been some ebbs where, you know, after 1920 and until 1963, nothing was happening, <laughs> kind of thing. Um, there's this idea that it's kind of naturally occurring, right, uh, in the ways that a lot of people think about progress, that progress kind of happens, um, like nature. Or even that there's this, this thing that you can call a wave, that you can see it. Right, that you, when you stand and you look out at the ocean or a little lake from the beach, you can see the waves. You know, it, it seems obvious to you what this thing is. 
Hewitt and other people in this volume kind of critique that idea and say that's, that's too tidy <laughs> to really encapsulate all that feminism is and has been. And of course, one of the critiques um, of the waves in general is that m many of these waves, especially up until fairly recently, have focused on um, uh, rights, so negotiating rights in the public sphere, and has focused a lot on the work of white women, um, and has made the work of other women less visible in the movement. So in, in the book, uh, um, a number of the writers kind of point out that the wave metaphor tends to um, downplay the leadership of women of color and even say that some um, African American women's movements, Native American women's movements, Asian women's movements were reactions to what white women were already doing. And these authors say, not quite the case, <laughs> right? Um, it suggests that it downplays the intersection between feminism and the many, many issues of justice that feminism has always intersected with. Um, that when we just talk about rights, we might be missing ideas about why people were interested in those rights in the first place. Why do people decide they needed the vote? Um, that there were often these kind of links with other justice issues that preceded or even overcame some of those questions of rights. They suggest that it, it downplays what has always been a critique of systemic forms of power, whether that be um, the economic system of slavery um, or um, the government takeover of lands of Native American people. That has been central to many forms of feminism and isn't always seen when we look at the wave metaphor. People suggest that it, it, it downplays alliances with men and others, <laughs> that alliances um, both between groups of feminists and, and with men um, has always been important to feminism. And in fact, one of the interesting critiques that is made in this book is that um, the idea of these waves kind of emphasizes conflicts between generations of women. Right, so that we see third wave feminists or even fourth wave feminists saying, oh, you know, those second wave feminists, why didn't they get it? Well, maybe you didn't read about them. <laughs> and I have to remind my students, um, you know, there were, there were women talking about intersectionality um, long before you or even your grandmother were born. Um, so if some of you went to this lecture a couple weeks ago on intersectionality, it was kind of means that um, uh, feminists in the past and present have thought of themselves not just as women, but as, say, black women or working class women, and that those were inseparable identities for them. And, and this is what I'll, I'll talk about um, mostly for the rest of the hour, is you know, thinking about what some critiques of the wave metaphor have said that it also downplays is um, the complex role of motherhood in feminism. Um, faith and even theology in feminism, which we often think of as sort of radically opposed to one another um, in contemporary discussions, they're not, <coughs> they haven't been. Um, that hybrid identities or intersectional identities have always been a source of this kind of a radical critique of power. And some of those things are a lot harder to see when you just think about this idea of ebbs and flows towards these new forms of rights. In the, in the book, Hewitt and her, and her colleagues suggest a different metaphor of radio waves rather than the, the idea of water waves that we often think about. Um, Hewitt suggests that if we think about feminism as more like radio waves, we have to understand that they're human created, it, that people are behind feminism. It's not just something that happens because time has passed. Um, it creates this idea of kind of patterns intersecting and colliding and bouncing off of one another, um, sometimes in conflict and sometimes syncing up to become louder. This idea that feminism can operate at higher and lower frequencies. So that wave metaphor that we often think of, she says that's the high frequency or the, the frequency that most people can, can hear <laughs> is, is the sort of uh, mainstream, sometimes called white feminism. But that doesn't mean there's other not other feminisms working at other frequencies. Um, and that these, these waves might travel across more or less space. They might be local, 
they might be national, they might be international. And so she uses this metaphor of radio waves. I think it's kind of an intriguing way to think about, uh, a different way to think about feminism. But I thought, well, what, what else might there be? So here's where I'm gonna get experimental. I'm trying on some stuff, just from my reading around in history. What else, what else have, whether we call them feminists or women's rights activists or anti-slavery activists or anti-racist activists, what, what else are they doing that we might think about as we think about what feminism or feminist history is? So let us fly into the air with Barbie and escape the bonds of our regular ways of seeing. So what if we thought about feminism as emerging from faith, spirituality, religion, theology. I'll admit, this is, this is one that I've struggled with. So um, having grown up with a mother who's Catholic and a father who's Methodist, my feminism seemed opposed to some of those things when I sort of learned more about it when I was in college. And that, that causes conflict for people um, that, that perhaps is an unnecessary conflict. So, you know, a couple of examples of this, um, Indigenous, Native American women in the social and political power that they held, certainly before European colonization, almost always drew on their roles as life givers, um, their connection to models of spiritualism and femininity, such as sky woman and changing woman, um, and even still today, um, these, these models of what a woman is are powerful <laughs> to young Native women. So the idea of, of Sky Woman is she, she, this is in a couple of different um, Native traditions, Anishinaabe, falling, falling down from this other place with her seeds, her pockets full of seeds, and that's where our plants came from. So she's this, the seed giver, the life giver, um, the changing woman. You see in um, like Navajo traditions, uh, she's a shape-shifting woman. She changes over the period of her life or in different situations. So these models have been around much, much longer than the United States, <laughs> right? Or, or certainly before 1848. Um, many, many of the early, what we would call now first wave feminists um, came at feminism from faith. Um, and a lot of that was anti-slavery activism. Um, that the, the Women's Rights Convention of 1848 was really a bunch of um, uh, anti-slavery activists who also were talking about women's rights. And that came from a place of believing that, in fact, slavery was morally wrong. Um, other black women who were early um, anti-slavery activists and women's rights, I guess we would call them now activists, um, act, being active on behalf of enslaved women and, and laboring women, people like Maria Stewart or Sojourner Truth who are speaking in the 1830s and 1840s about the need to end um, these immoral situations in which women found themselves. Um, black women's organizing has historically and still continues to emerge from the black church which is one of the places where, where black women have been able to find their voice. Um, so even beginning with people like uh, Maria Stewart, um, Nanny Helen Burroughs, and other uh, black activists of the early 20th century who were both suffrage activists, but also um, operating out of their churches on behalf of their communities. Um, Burroughs created the Women's Auxiliary of the Baptist Church, um, so said, hey, Baptist men are in charge in the church. We have our own agenda, and we're going to do it over here, and it's going to come out of our faith tradition. Um, other civil rights activists, Fannie Lou Hamer, um, Prothea Hall, they were ministers and civil rights activists. So we often you know, think of MLK Jr. as the, the, the prototypical civil rights activist slash minister, but there were women that were doing that work as well. And also, you know, countless women, you know, just cooking in church basements throughout this long era between 1900 and 1960s um, and, 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 and keeping political culture alive uh, for, for a lot of African-American women. Um, Catholic women like Dorothy Day, who organized her work not just around suffrage but around peace 
shelter for the homeless, um, workers' rights. She's the founder of the Catholic Worker Movement. Um, and her work took most place mostly in kind of this, this dead zone between like 1930 and 1960. So if you think of that time period as when nothing was happening in feminism, you're looking in the wrong places, <laughs> right? So um, just of those as a couple of examples, and, and I'll give one more example um, that I just became more aware of because of a research project that I've been working on with some colleagues and some alumni, um, the example of Augustana College in the 1980s and 1990s, um, and activism around um, LGBTQ identities. Um, and I think they, the students who were working to be seen on campus had support from campus ministries and not support from some other places. Um, so I think there are ways that we can think about um, spirituality, religion, as places where feminism happens, and I think that might be very useful um, politically today when often religion is aligned with more conservative and sometimes I would say even anti-woman forces. What if we thought about feminism as rooted in the needs of community? I think this is one of the oldest forms of what we now call feminism that there is. Women have been advocating for their communities always, always. <laughs> feminism has always come out of local situations. Um, this is the source of, of leadership for a lot of um, indigenous women and non-binary indigenous people. Um, the crusade for um, native sovereignty is certainly tied to um, women's power and the power of, of uh, either two-spirit or non-binary people in indigenous communities um, because the breakdown of native cultures also broke down the forms of power that those folks had. Um, a lot of Native women are also active around issues of food sovereignty. How do you feed people with the food that is local to the place where you are? Water rights is another example. If you remember the, um, the protests at uh, Dakota Access Pipeline, or women were on the forefront of that crusade from the, from the first. Locally, here in um, the Quad Cities, I think of people like Jenny McCowan, who was one of the first women doctors in Iowa um, starting in the 1870s, and she moves to uh, Davenport around 1880. She organized the Lend a Hand Club um, that was for single working women in the 1880s and 1890s, so working out of her own community. Um, Cecile Cooper, also from Davenport, um, she ran a beauty shop in Davenport in the 50s and 60s. She organized the Fidelis Club and the Semper Fidelis Club and the QC Negro Heritage Club was very active in civil rights in the community, um, helped fund education, um, and create aid for struggling folks in the Quad Cities and beyond. Mab Segrist, a white lesbian woman from the South who turned her activism on behalf of lesbian women against the KKK in the South, where she saw those two fights as connected to one another. Um, Dolores Huerta, um, one of the founders of the United Farm Worker Association, was deeply rooted in her community of farm workers, um, and and part of part of her work came out of simply taking care of those in her community, and it became a much larger and global movement because of that that kind of work. So I think about how this way of thinking about feminism brings to light the many ways that women have worked alongside men in their communities and have challenged them by asking how even crusades for rights, civil rights, um, have served those who are least powerful in the community. And I think as we look around our own community today, we often see women at the forefront of organizing still today um, around things like um, violence um, in the streets, uh, even the apartment collapse over in Davenport. There were women who were out there protesting um, and speaking to the city council because they want safe places for people to live in the community where they are. What if we thought about feminism as care for the bodies and minds of other people? I don't even know what that, an image for that might look like, but it is so central to so many different kinds of feminism um, for all time. And when I think about this, I think about um, uh, African-American feminist Bell Hooks, 
uh, I can't remember which essay it is of her, but she writes uh, a paragraph or two about Frederick Douglass's mother. So Frederick Douglass was an abolitionist, African-American, uh, grew up in slavery. And a tiny part of his autobiography, he writes about his mother walking 10 miles in the night, because he lived somewhere else, um, to lie down with him while he slept, and then walking back to where she lived. And it's just a tiny part of his autobiography. But she said, wow, think about the, the Herculean effort of this mother to care for her child in any way that she could. And she says, that is a feminist act. Um, and those kinds of small acts of resistance to care for others, I think, are, have been central to so many kinds of feminism that go under the radar. Um, womanism, which is a, a kind of feminism or a resistance to feminism that comes specifically out of um, black women's experience. It centers their bodies, their relationships with their children, their experience, their relationship and love for one another. That's how they develop their theology and their theories for change. What is my connection to and love for those around me? Questions about how we care for and nurture one another, including the earth, right? Um, how does that determine our politics? So if we thought of ourselves as in community with those around us, caring for them, asking questions about um, how do we care for others, but also how do we care for those people who are caring for others? I've had this discussion with students in my um, classes over the last couple years as we thought about the COVID pandemic and what it took to care for one another and how we could have cared for one another better if caring for one another were more central to the ways that we organize our lives. So I'm not saying that rights aren't important, <laughs> um, but one of the, the ways that we seem to be at odds with one another in a lot of present day discussions is we're always trying to figure out where do your rights end and mine begin? And where is that line? And the fact is, it is very hard to tell. <laughs> um, and so it, it might be obvious, I live over in Iowa. Um, but I was thinking, you know, what, how might some of the current debates that we have about abortion access um, or transgender kids look different if we thought more about the collective care and nurturing of every body rather than things like parental rights, fetal rights, these are very hard discussions to resolve. Um, but I think we have, because we've been talking about how to care for one another and doing that care since, I hate it when my students say, since throughout history. Because <laughs> I'm like, when? No, nothing's throughout history. But I think actually caring for one another is actually something that has happened throughout human history. Um, and it's, it's, it's something that we could think about a lot more than, than we do. So, I mean, some, some feminists talk about something called embodied politics, right? That our relationship to the world um, comes out of not just our bodies, but our bodies' relationships to other people. So even questions like, um, how do we feed ourselves and those we love um, can be feminist questions. Um, how do we raise our children if we have them in safe environments where we don't have to worry about them going to school or walking down the street uh, or drinking contaminated water or having lead in their yards and their houses. That if we think about the needs of the body um, as important, we start thinking about you know what, what, what might that world look like and, and how have women organized around the needs of the body. And I think that extends to um, questions of labor as well um, that all around the world, uh, women are disproportionately caring for other people um, in childhood and in old age. And we know that work is very um, poorly paid around the world. What would it look like to value that work more? What if um, women care workers did not have to travel halfway around the world um, to care for people in the United States while their own children in the Philippines or in Africa um, might be making their way on their own or being cared for by relatives. So we have this strange economy of care um, where some women are caring 
for other women um, and maybe not getting paid that much to do it. And, and that has been so important to so much feminist organizing um, for, for literally centuries, these questions about um, uh, care. And it's been a source of change and, and even, yes, rights. <laughs> Asking for rights has been important to that as well. So I guess in some ways, it's, it, I kind of want to end with this idea of um, caring for the body as a way to return to Barbie. Right? Because, of course, one of the ways that Barbie has been so controversial and so much of, like, critique of Barbie is from feminists, from my students, from others, has been about her impossible body. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, you know, why do we give little girls this, this impossible body? <laughs> um, and, and try to imagine how they could see their own bodies in, 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 in this one. And I think that's, I mean, that's one of the questions that the Barbie movie addresses, you know, what? What kind of different kind of Barbie bodies can we can we imagine? I do think about creative play with Barbies, which I think the, the movie alludes to. Most people I know who have ever played with Barbies, and I have surveyed my students about this, and boys have played with Barbie too, um, have played with Barbie in her body in very creative ways. I won't go into a lot of detail, but one example, uh, when I was a kid, I would play with my friend and um, her sisters, she had twin sisters, who were kind of a handful, had made their Barbies into zombies <laughs> by, <laughs> I love the creativity here. They took those pins, you know, with the, with the balls on the end that were white and stuck them in their eyes so they had no pupils. And then they, would, they took razors and kind of shaved some of their skin so that it looked like their skin was falling off. And then the, those zombie Barbies could, could chase the other Barbies around. And weird, but so creative, <laughs> right? That if you want to imagine a zombie Barbie, you could make one. Um, that family also had one of those giant share dolls. It was like a permutation of Barbie. And that, she was a giant, and she would go around and stomp on everybody. Um, even playing with my own daughter, we had a, a Barbie who was Barbie who and then we had a Barbie named Jill who was just angry all the time. And she was a teacher. <laughs> and I was usually Jill. <laughs> and we had so much fun with Jill. Um, my daughter and my son used to play a game called Barbies and Cars, where Barbie would interact with Matchbox cars. No problem. They'd just talk to each other and they'd drive around and go about their business, right? So couldn't Barbie play with cars? Sure. So my point being, even though Barbie has like this, this impossible body that doesn't really represent what most of us are or possibly even want to be, we have played creatively with Barbie for the however many years she's been around, 60, 70, something like that. Can we be as creative in thinking about what feminism is and what feminist history has been as we are with our Barbie play? And what new ways of thinking about um, activism, feminism, womanism, um, justice, might that enable if we kind of have a bigger picture or a better picture of all of the ways that women and their <coughs> allies have crusaded to make a better life. So thanks a lot for looking at all my different pictures of Barbie and I'm happy to answer questions if I can. Thank you. So let's give her a round of applause. Thank you, Dr. Simonson. Yes, take a drink of water. Any questions for Dr. Simonson? And if you do, I'm going to ask you to just use the microphone so everyone in the room can hear. Oops, sorry. What were the uh, names of the two work a lot artists? The artists or? The, the authors, of, uh, like the, the names of the authors. Oh, of the book, No Permanent Waves? Oh, I'm not with it. Uh, it's, um, the, 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 there are two black women. One, Belinda Hand Club, and the other one. Oh, okay. So Jenny McCowan was the woman. She was a, a white woman doctor in uh, Davenport in the late 19th century. Uh, J-E-N-N-I-E. 
M C C O W E N, I think is correct. Um, there is a really good book. Oh boy, I just blanked out on the name of it. Sharon, Sharon wrote it. <laughs> it's about women in Davenport in the at the turn of the century. Oh. Freedom of the Streets. It's called Freedom of the Streets. So if you want to learn more about um, the Lend a Hand Club and Jenny McCowan in um, Davenport, that book is um, I think still in publication. Um, it's a really interesting book. So um, I mentioned Jenny McCowan, and then who was the other person? I think I mentioned. Um, 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 Oh, Anita Hill. So Anita Hill uh, um, was the uh, a lawyer who testified at the Clarence Thomas hearings in 91, 92, uh, who testified that he had sexually harassed her. Um, and what was interesting about that, of course, was that uh, Thomas is black. And part of that, um, the uproar around that, you know, having a woman saying, hey, this guy um, has harassed me, was that it was seen as kind of an attack on black men, who of course have, have had all kinds of accusations thrown at them um, about various abuses of women. But Anita Hill is black too. And so some people said, well, you know, it, it's important, it's not that the you know, white community is trying to take down this black man, it's, it's a woman talking about what actually happened to her as a black person and a woman. So yeah, there's a couple books over there, um, Anita Hill, and then the other book that I mentioned that's over there is um, uh, Betty Friedan's book, The Feminine Mystique from 1963. So Friedan was a journalist, she actually came out of, kind of labor organizing, um, she's from Peoria, she's Jewish, um, and so a lot of her politics came out of some of those experiences. Like, so she was a super smart Jewish woman who grew up in Peoria, which wasn't um, super friendly um, to the, her <laughs> as a smart Jewish woman, um, and went on to lead um, National Organization of Women for a long time, and, and really kind of led a lot of crusades for women's rights. And like I said, her, her book really kind of focuses on um, interviews with um, college women, college graduates of Smith College, I think that's right, um, about what it was like for them to be educated for careers and in mostly in the 50s and then um, get married and, and not be able to practice those careers. So it was a really um, kind of a woo moment for a, a lot of women um, in the 60s and 70s. There are legitimate reasons to, to critique making that book central to understanding feminism of that time period, of course, because um, lots of women have always worked outside the home. <laughs> and so imagining you know, the, the, the inability to work outside the home as the main thing oppressing women did, didn't make sense to a lot of women who were like, well, I worked. Even now I say to my students, when they're like, women didn't work outside the home until 1967. I'm like, well, did your grandma work? And they say, she did. <laughs> um, so, you know, we, we all know that, that, that that's not actually what happened, but I think that, that narrative kind of gets attached to um, Betty Friedan's book a lot. But it's, it's a really important read, right, for understanding uh, feminist movement of that time period. <laughs> and Friedan changed some of her own politics over her lifetime. I mean, she often gets people are like, she hated lesbians. She wasn't very friendly to lesbians being um, connected to the feminist movement at the beginning because she was worried about um, people rejecting the whole thing. And of course, you know, a lot of third wave, fourth wave feminists went, Mrr. right? And for good reason, um, but that's what she did at the time and she actually changed some of her thinking about um, women by the 1980s and 1990s. So um, one of the things we think about, you know, when we talked about that intergenerational con conflict some of my students have trouble understanding the worlds in which women lived at the time they lived. You know, and they're like, why are they always talking about motherhood? It's like, well, that's because what they, that was what they had to do. Like, that's what their lives were. They, <laughs> they had children, and that's how they thought of themselves. Um, so, yeah, so that, that's a long answer, but that, that, I think, was the third book that I mentioned. That's, that's Any other questions? I 
I'm not so sure as, as much of a question as just, I can't understand. I never, even when I watched the movie, philosophically, I cannot understand all the women in power today who are so against the word feminism and also rights that I feel we should have. And I don't know yeah. if there's any explanation, probably yeah. not. I mean, there are some really good books out there that are on um, conservative women's movements. So like 10 or 12 years ago, um, Kathleen Rimpf wrote a book about Republican women. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways to answer that question. I think in some ways, here, in, if we call this the fourth wave, if you think about feminism as just about my ability to do what I think is right for me, like what you know, what does liberty mean for me? Then anything can be feminism, right? <laughs> so I think that's one of the things that's problematic. So somebody could say, well, feminism for me is this thing that other feminists say is absolutely antithetical to feminism. So I think one response that that others have today is that that feminism is is not and never has been a, only about your rights. It's about others too, <laughs> um, and and I think that that's a place where people come come to logger loggerheads. Um, you know, some some people have written, especially about conflicts between um, feminists who come out of faith traditions and feminists who are more secular. Um, is that that both groups have to kind of let go of the universality of their beliefs, right? That they. We tend to always take the moral high ground because we believe our beliefs are the only beliefs. Mm -hmm. And that's especially hard when it comes to matters of faith, right? Because why else would you be faithful if you didn't think that was the, you know, the, the, the way to be? But I think there's some really great ways to think about um, when organizing, and not just feminine organizing, feminist organizing, any organizing is at its best, is when communities with very different belief systems can still find common ground. Right, and, and that can be very hard to do, um, but I think it's possible. Like, there's not that many groups of people who don't want to care for their communities. I mean, we might see it coming in very different directions, up to very different directions about what that means, but it might at least be a place where a conversation could start and people could come back to understand why do you think caring for your community involves this and, and you think it this. So I don't know if I fully answered your question, but I, I do think that, um, yeah, what some people see as choice feminism or neoliberal feminism um, can, can pit people against one another because if we're thinking on the level of the individual, we almost never come to common ground. All right, probably have time for one more. Yeah, good one. <laughs> <laughs> Setting you up. Well, speaking of loggerheads, don't you think that the reversal of Roe threw a big rock in the middle of all these waves that sort of blended them together for a while? Yeah, yeah that's a good way to think about it, like <laughs> ripples. I mean, I guess maybe having a ripple effect could be a good way to think about it. And honestly, I, I don't know what's going to happen here, but I do think that overturning Roe could be a source of commonality for women who may think of themselves at at least somewhat different ends of the political spectrum. I mean, you look at places like Kansas or even Iowa, right, that, that for, or even for people who believe strongly in individual rights, that is a challenge. Um, and people, people do believe strongly that this, this is an issue over which women should have at least some control. So I don't, I'm really curious as to how that, you know, even looking at politics, that that has made people go, uh, I don't know if we want to go that far. Um, so I think that could be an interesting ripple that both divides people, but may push people to kind of find some more common definitions, right, about what justice means. To them. I mean, there's, if people don't know this term, there's this term that's been around also since about 1992 called reproductive justice um, that came out of a, a black women's organizing group. 
that says that reproductive justice is not just about the right to have an abortion, but the right to have children if you want children, and people say you shouldn't have children, which is an issue that people face. Um, a separation from children. So if we think about some of the things that have been happening at the border, like if you're separated from your children against your will and their will, that is an issue of reproductive justice. Um, even access to health care, um, pregnancy care is an issue of reproductive justice, the, the right to raise your child in a safe environment. And that, you know, cast that, that bigger circle into a lot, a lot more people can fit themselves into at least part of that framework um, than maybe abortion debates. Great question. Well, thank you, everyone, and thank you, Dr. Thanks Simonson. Thanks for coming around.